morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's so fun to be here. My name is Celine, and I think all of you should recognize Austin, or most of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Austin's raised in this church, and since I'm his wife, I also get the family treatment, and so I'm always happy to come here. You guys are always treating us so kindly. We love this church. We love the congregation, and uh, when Wendy asked if we want to play, we said, yes, of course. It's so much fun to come and join you guys. So, yeah, let's all stand up. We're going to worship together, and... Uh, Yeah, we worship you, Lord. We lift your name on high. Yeah, I'd love if we can all just start praying together. Just out loud, we can just uh, brag on our Jesus today. Holy Spirit, we love you. We welcome you into this room. We say thank you, God. What an honor and a privilege it is to spend this time in your presence together. We don't take it for granted, God. We don't take it for granted. Lord, we love you. We love you, God. Holy Spirit, come and move today. Come and move. Yeah, any agenda we might have, we lay it down at your feet, God. And we welcome you. King above all kings. Come and invade in this space, God. We love you.
God, God, we thank you for showing up in this place, pouring out your love. And we just breathe it in, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. morning it's like is it just you brother come on up got your garb on there for uh cub scouts that looks good huh you got your weeblos but man you got a lot of stuff on there that's cool right on uh so today good morning everybody by the way how are we we good yeah uh praise jesus right yeah so we are kind of, uh, well, we got, we're going to go over some couple parables today. Um, the, we, were, we were talking last week about Jesus and being the, the prophet, the last one, right? Um, and I, the uh, lessons that we were going, going to go through are like, in our book, are like uh, stuff that happened before he died. So I'm going to opt to go to the, prophet, to the um, parable things. And um, we're going to talk about the, uh, the sower and um, the Good Samaritan today, so, uh, which are like two of my favorites, and there's many, many more, but uh, we'll focus on those today. So let's bless, let's bless all the children, even in this room, God. We just ask that your hand would be upon all of us, God, uh, that we would continue to um, glean from your words, God, and glean from your spirit. Uh, Lord, we ask for protection and guidance uh, in all of our lives and all the things that we do uh, to grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Christopher, if you, don't want to, if you don't mind, we wanted to share your accomplishment. Is that okay? Yeah? Why don't you go ahead and get it and bring it up? I, I just Christopher shared this with Jay and I before the service this morning. I just think it's really cool because there's a prophetic word on this board about Christopher for one thing, but first... Christopher, why don't you um, share and speak really clearly so everyone can understand how it is that you earned this and what it is. So this is the arrow of light, and you get this. This is the highest rank in Cub Scouts so you can get. The only rank that can get it is Weeblos 2s. He's going to be moving on to Boy Scouts on Wednesday. And... Um, all of you stand for the different ranks and badges. I actually made these, uh, the arrow by myself and uh, not completely by myself, but with some other people. But the, like I said, the arrow of like ice break and, and Cub Scouts. And so I'm really happy that I got this rank. So. Um. Yeah, so Christopher's moving up from Cub Scouts into Boy Scouts this Wednesday. And on the board, it, it says, Christopher Krupp, Arrow of Light. I love that. <laughs> and that's, it's a truth. You're an arrow. You know, God talks about us being like arrows in a quiver. And um, you're in the Lord's quiver, Christopher, and you're his arrow, and you're an arrow of light. And so we just, we just bless that word over you. Amen. Well, he's an arrow of light. I feel like everything I do is a shot in the dark. <laughs> All right, so let's get started today. The first thing I'd like to say is if you're new here to Crossroads, you can look up on that chair that's in front of you, and there's a welcome card. If you'd fill that out and you'd put it in one of the offering baskets, we'd love to get in contact with you, and we're not trying to uh, turn you into the government or something crazy like that. So don't worry. We'd just love to have somebody go out and talk to you and get to know you a little bit if you'd like to be involved in our church. And next up, we've got our Adults Night Out that's hosted by the Hoys, and they just, they're just they wonderful people, and they've thought that they would be happy to organize something for all the adults here at Crossroads to do. It's going to be funny. It's going to be fun. And we'd love to see you there. So go get signed, for, signed up for that if you're interested. Next up, 
is going to be worship night. The theme of this worship night is going to be times of refreshing. And beyond that, I don't have any more information for you other than it's going to be just a great time together as a church. We're going to sing. We're going to laugh. We're going to have great joy. And we're going to feel refreshed. After that, after the service today, we're going to have a prayer for some of our excellent workers and servants of God who are serving in foreign nations. So if you'd stick around after service, we're going to have a time of prayer for that. And we'd love to have you there. We'd love to share in this act of faith as a church where we are going to get together and pray for these people who are doing important work. And finally, we've got the offering. Now, I normally talk a lot for the offering, but today I thought I'd let the word of God speak for itself. So whoever sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. For you should give whatever you have decided to give, because God loves a cheerful giver. Now with that, I would say if you want to give, if you've decided to give, that is, you can give in the offering baskets there, there, and there. You could give by mail to our P.O. box as listed up on the slide, or you could give online through our website. Any of those is good, none is inferior to the other. And on that bombshell, I'd like to say, let's get on with the rest of the service. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah. I'm like double dipping because yesterday is my birthday, but today's the party, you know? And so kind of planned it that way because uh, it's fun. Thank you, uh, Celine and Austin. Um, they actually share a house with Dawson and Emily. Uh, I, I sent them a picture this week of Austin and Dawson. They were both in diapers, you know, rolling in the mud. And now they're sharing a house together. So, yeah. How are they doing about keeping those the sink dishes? You know, Austin, Dawson, are they? Okay, just, just checking. Make, make sure that's, that's working out. Um, glad to be with you here. I just want to give a shout out to uh, the guys in the back. We have a rotation, but it's got uh, Tim and Kellen and Garrett this morning. And, you know... The rest of most of you come here at about 10 o'clock and you're here for an hour and a half. These guys come an hour and a half before you do just to get ready. And, uh, and you know, if you come and you have an off day, nobody notices it. You just sit there quiet. If they have an off day back there, everybody notices it and they look back there. But it's not very often they have an off day because they, they work hard at their, their craft back there. And uh, those of you done live stream, uh, you appreciate that, right? That the, the sound is there, the images are there. Uh, by the way, if you're on the live stream, I put something in the chat box today. We just like to know that you're there. I know some of you are there, but you don't chat. Just put like, happy birthday, Jay, today, okay? <laughs> That's just a way that we'll know that you're out there with us. Um, Father, we need help this morning. All of us do. This is what you're about. Um, that's what grace is about. Um, so we believe that the, what you've done this morning and what you're going to do the rest of this time will propel us in a good way to this week. I pray, God, that I'll speak in a way that honors you, that's clear to you. God, and I pray that the one listening in the room or online that does not yet, has not yet experienced a new birth um, can hear clearly the good news. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm talking again this morning about following Jesus. How is that? I could talk about the Masters Golf Tournament that's going on right now. My guy, my guy Bryson DeChambeau, is not trending so well right now. I could talk about my birthday party, too. I'm interested in that as well. But uh, those things are for today only. Uh, following Jesus is for all of life and for life after life. So... Um, and speaking of following, following Jesus is more than believing certain key truths about God. There certainly are important truths to believe. But following is more than that. And following is more than gathering with other people in a church or with a fellowship of friends, though. Gathering is also part of following. But when we talk about following Jesus, we're talking about how would Jesus live your life if he were you, if he were in your body, in the family you're in, 
married to the person you are, if you are, if he had your job, and he had your life circumstances, however good, bad, or ugly they may be right now, if Jesus were in that, what would he do? That's the question that we're, we're pursuing together because that's what he wants to do. He wants to empower you to be the you that he would be if he were in you, okay? Um, and this following Jesus is the road less traveled. Um, there are many detours, there's many ditches, there's many uh, dead ends, there's many ways that look attractive, like, hey, do it this way. You know, I read this book, saw this on a website, and so many of those just lead nowhere except to emptiness and disappointment. Um, you know, shortly after we uh, decided to call this church Crossroads, we came across this verse in Jeremiah 6.16. This is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask where the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. And we thought, that's such a cool verse, and we put it on our brochures and some of our marketing stuff. We left out the last sentence there, though. But Jeremiah did not leave it out. But you said, we will not walk in it. So the ancient paths, the, the good way, rest for your souls, it, it sounds amazing. But in Jeremiah's day and in our day, there's people that say, no thank you. Or they take one of those other wrong roads, thinking it's the right road, and they, they get in a place where they're lonely and hurting, and it doesn't help them. So this morning in our passage in Luke chapter 12, the first 11 verses, what we're going to look at, Jesus names two key hindrances to following well. Last week we talked one of the petitions in the Lord's prayers, uh, lead us not into temptation. Well, this morning Jesus is going to lift up two capital T temptations. Um, so, so let's dive in. Verse 1, chapter 12. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. So just picture it. It's a huge, desperate crowd. Um, these are people who are suffering from the bad effects of their bad lives, but they think that Jesus can maybe do something for them. And so they're just pushing and shoving and climbing over one another to get to them. And Jesus was always so good at, in deep compassion, meeting the needs of the crowd. He was doing it then. He's doing it today as well. Um, but increasingly in Luke's gospel and really all the gospels, as the public ministry goes on this three years, Jesus gives more time and more attention to the, the inner core, the, the disciples, these, these followers. Because these are the men, and there's going to be women too that are beyond the 12. These are the ones that are going to be leading the movement once he dies, rises, and ascends to heaven again. They're going to be leading the movement. They're going to have to live out the movement. So he gives more of attention to say, guys, I want to talk to you in specific. I'm going to still heal the, heal the crowds, do that, but I, I want to give more time to you because you're going to have to carry this moment. You know, I love big events. I love Easter Sunday. Uh, I was here yesterday for Inspire. I love the, the luncheon and the testimonies and that. I love that we can send kids to summer camp. All of that is beautiful. People... God speaks to people, people get saved, um, it's inspiring. But the larger impact for the kingdom of God is when ordinary men, women, and children just go about your daily stuff following Jesus. That's what really pushes the needle forward. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, this is the message paraphrase, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. So, back to Luke chapter 12, Jesus serves up the first warning to us, the first temptation. He says, beyond... Your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees 
which is hypocrisy. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Hypocrisy. And that word uh, hypocrite actually comes from the Greek theater. Uh, hypocrites were people who would, in the Greek theater, they typically wear a mask. They, they played a part. They played a role in some kind of production. They were an actor. Um, and, and they called those people uh, hypocrites. Um, and so Jesus, in his day, actually the Pharisees that he's calling out, they actually were pretty well respected among the people. The, the, the Sadducees controlled the Jerusalem temple, and people kind of knew that those guys were in cahoots with the Romans, and they kind of knew those guys were just kind of feathering their own nest. But the, the Pharisees had this reputation. Those guys are doing it. They were like the Green Berets. They didn't have official offices or you know, a base of authority. They just lived it out. Now, Jesus knew that in their heart and in their secret places, there was a different story. So he calls out the, the Pharisees for what's really going on with him. Um, but, you know, there, I think there's a tendency in all of us to want to present ourselves as better than we are. This thing called hypocrisy is not just for devious people that are uh, like a Pharisee. It's, it's, it's a temptation for so many of us to wear a mask, to... Uh, to want to be thought of in a certain way. And, and, you know, I think this is particularly so when you're in a community like the church where we have high standards of how to live. We have high hopes. You know, we're going to go for it. And so it's easy to pretend that I'm living a certain way because I want to live that way. And I think, well, you know, it'd be kind of embarrassing if people know that I'm not doing that and maybe even discourage the fellowship or discourage my small group. And so I think this tendency to kind of fake it is there to, to keep a mask on. Um, there's an old saying in uh, recovery circles, AA and uh, related recovery ministries and circles, says, we're only as sick as our secrets. Okay? By the way, you know, the, the foundation principles of AA and the 12 steps, that was, that were that was people that knew Jesus. They, you know, they, they came together. The foundation of AA is, is based in the scriptures. We're only as sick as our, as sick as our secrets. And it, what it means is, it's kind of what Jesus is saying. A secret, when it's kept in the dark, it grows. Jesus says it's like yeast. It grows, it expands, and it becomes harmful. And, uh, and Jesus is just saying, hey, it's going to come out eventually. It's going to come out. Your spouse is going to figure it out. Your kids, as they grow up, are kind of going to figure out, you know what? That, that was kind of weird, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. And they, it comes out, Jesus said. It's, you know, it's going to get out there. So get honest now. Come clean now. Say, hey, I really want to be this, but man, I am not there right now. I need help. Would you pray for me? Um. Choose honesty over what? Protecting our image or protecting our reputation. Uh, that was my me mentor uh, in pastoral ministry, Bill Frizzell. Um, went to be with Jesus in 1995. But Bill, uh, when he would preach, and by the way, Bill rarely preached less than an hour. If, you got, if he preached for an hour, you wondered, well, what, 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 what was going on there? But Bill would... Sometimes he would come. Some, how many of you heard Bill Frizzell preach? Raise a hand. A few of you did. Okay. Bill would sometimes come, and at the beginning of the message, he would say, you know, um, I'm not doing well today. I'm kind of teed off. And Bill could get teed off. Or something would say, you know what? Um, Carol and I had a fight, and we're still not over it. <laughs> or sometimes he would just say, you know, I'm just exhausted um and then and then he would have somebody pray for him. he said could somebody pray for me and and somebody would stand up and pray for him and invariably telling the truth added to the power of his preaching rather than somebody saying 
man, I, you had a fight with your wife? I'm not going to listen to you, or, you know, whatever the thing was. That, that honesty that Bill had added to the power of the message. I was thinking this week, I wish I had more of that vulnerability myself. I wish I practiced more of that vulnerability myself. But Bill did. And I saw it, and I, I know it's, it's, a, it's an area that I need to grow in. Maybe some of you need to grow in, too whether you preach or not, just being, being honest and then asking for prayer. Um, I appreciate on Easter Sunday, we were up here, you know, Dawson gave the altar call and we were up here and Wendy and I were over there and Dawson and Emily were up here, you know, and then, and then after a little bit, Emily came over to us and she just asked prayer for something in her life. And I really appreciate it. Like here, here she's up front, she's the preacher's wife that morning, but she comes over to her in-laws of all people and says, hey, would you pray for me? And just something that I need that she had. That's the kind of vulnerability that cleans out the yeast of hypocrisy that wants to just grin. What did somebody say? Men's group, fake it till you make it, you know. Um, John Wooden, the amazing Christ follower and basketball coach, he said this, be more concerned with your character than your reputation. Because your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think you are. So hypocrisy is when our image keeping trumps our honesty. I want to give you four affirmations that I think can be helpful to embrace and remember to overcome the tendency to pretend, to try to be somebody. Here's the first one. You are not what you have. So your possessions and your wealth, whether you have a lot or little, they don't define you, okay? Secondly, you are not what you do. Your achievements or your failures, they can be satisfying or sad, but they don't definitively define you or me. Number three, you are not what others think of you, be that positive or, or negative. A human judgments are never the final word for any of us. Apostle Paul at one point says, hey, I don't, I don't, even, I don't even judge myself. You know, I, I'm just, he's not, he said, I, I'm just, I, I, I leave my judgment for the Lord. So, so we don't have to pretend in those realms. We don't have to look like, hey, I've got this kind of stuff or, you know, this is what I, what I can do or, you know. We, we can give that up because uh, that, well, because of this. You are who God says who you are. Now, we could go to a hundred different places in the Bible that would say who you are, but here's one. Isaiah 43, 4, just saw this in the, in the New Living the other day. You are precious to me. You are honored, and I love you. We just believe that. Um, we don't have to fake it okay to be honest. I'm, I'm somebody that's loved. I'm struggling, but I'm loved. I'm, man, I messed up, but you know what? I'm precious if we believe that. There's a second warning that Jesus has in this passage. He says in verse 4, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. You know, when, when Jesus' words in the Gospel of Luke were first being distributed about mid-first century, that's when Luke, uh, the, the Gospel began to be accessible to the church, a martyrdom was a real thing. People were being put to death for Jesus, or people were being stood up and said, you know, do you have this faith in Jesus? And if they said yes, they said, well, recant, or we're going to kill you. And that happened. People, awful things happen to them. And it was a real issue in the church, this issue of apostasy. There were people who believed and were baptized <clears throat> and then under threat of being beaten or executed, people said, okay, I don't, I don't believe anymore. Um, so uh, when Luke was writing this, this was a real thing in, in churches, you know. Um, now, <clears throat> we're not there yet in the United States. Some places in the world they are. But where we are is, it's the old phrase, the fear of man. 
I don't know how to update that, fear of men or women, however you would say that. It's, it's when um, we don't speak about Jesus because we're intimidated by the person that we're going to speak to. They might push back, or it might be awkward, or uh, they might think we're weird and ostracize us and you work with them, all, all kinds of things. Or there's some um, key value to assert or uphold that, that really matters to God, and we just, we just know if we bring that thing up, man, we might, we might uh, consequence for it. And so we don't share our faith that we want to share because of fear of man. And we don't go from that, you know, you're having a conversation with somebody, and then you want to ask, uh, you know, you're just talking about the Seahawks and the weather and your birthday party, and then you want to ask a little bit more probing question, but ah, if I do that, we don't. It's, it's this fear of man. It's this intimidation. Um, and, and so we end up being polite. That's the word Wendy and I talk about. Let's not be so doggone polite, particularly when there's an issue that, hey, I need to be persuasive and passionate because this really matters to God and it matters to these people that I'm around. Um, and I think what Jesus is saying here in verses 4 and 5, he said, it's an illusion that that person has authority over you. It's an illusion that the culture or the, the government edict really has authority over you. Oh, it's true. In extreme cases, you might get fired from your job. You might get kicked out of your friend group. Other people can make life difficult for you. But the one, Jesus said, who has real authority over you and I, the one who's running the show, the one to whom we will face one day, that one, that's the one who has authority. Fear that one, Jesus says. Yeah. You know, uh, Pontius Pilate was interrogating Jesus in, in John chapter 19. And, and Jesus was kind of being unresponsive. And Pilate was frustrated because he kind of was sympathetic to Jesus. He didn't really like what the Jews were doing, but he's trying to ask some questions, you know, to clarify the deal. And Jesus just isn't answering him. He's not playing Pilate's game. And finally, Pilate is frustrated, and he, he blurts, blurts out in verse 10. You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And I'm sure when Pilate had said that to many other people, they just cowered. I would love to see how Jesus looked back at Pilate. Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. See, Jesus understood that Pilate didn't have any authority. Uh, yeah, he was the representative of the great Roman Empire, but it was a mirage. Jesus understood my loyalty to the Father because he has all authority. I, I'm not, I'm not going to play by your rules because you, don't, you can't do anything unless God permits it to happen. So when this fear of man is rising in our heart, the fear of the Lord has to be our response. Like, man, I don't know what's going to happen, but God, I, I want to be loyal to you. I don't want to disappoint you. I want to obey you more than taking that other road. Uh, several years ago, I was uh, on San Jose State University, and it was part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and we were doing an evangelism outreach kind of a deal, training, and then we'd go out. And I remember going out, uh, and in the summertime on college campuses, particularly in the afternoon, they're pretty, uh, not too many people around. And I saw this guy out there, and he was a big guy. He was like a Mark Pedelford sized guy, you know. He was a skinhead guy, dark glasses. And I go up to him, and I was, I was about a buck sixty back then, you know. And I go up and and I said, um, you know, I f said something like, "Excuse me, can I, um, can I talk to you about Jesus?" And and the guy looked at me, and he, <laughs> this is what he said. He said, "Boy." Do you know what it is to kill a man with your bare hands? And I kind of flinched a little bit. You had one of the little tremors go through me, and I kind of looking around like, I don't see anybody within 100 yards of where we are. We're out in the athletic field. <laughs> and I just, 
I thought for a minute, and I, I think the line we were using back then was something like, hey, do, do you have a sense of personal sin in your life? It was like that. <laughs> and it just cut this guy open. And he went from being this guy that was going to destroy me to this guy that just broke down. He didn't receive Christ, but he, he did come to him, like some meetings that we had. You know, but it was just that moment of like, uh, maybe I'll try somebody else. Um, but for every time that I have been faithful, there's been so many other times when I have not. Why? It's this fear of man that Jesus is, is talking about. And then in our Luke 12 passage, Jesus does what he often does. He's just spoken about fearing this God who can throw you into hell. And that is a true and sobering statement. There is a hell, and God can decide who goes there. And then the very next phrase, Jesus says, and it's an assuring word for those who hear and respond who, to the hard word. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You just got to love how Jesus sets you up. He says the hard thing, and the hard thing is true, and the hard thing needs to be believed and received. And then he brings that, that grace word to us right alongside of it. You know, um, Israel has long been a home for sparrows. Jesus was doing his ministry in Israel, if you're new to the Bible. In fact, some of the earliest fossil remnants of sparrows are found in a cave outside of Bethlehem. So sparrows were common in Jesus' day and still are. Uh, but they're so common that even today, bird watchers don't go out to see sparrows. People don't get out their cameras to take pictures of sparrows, although I, I like that picture a lot. They're looking for other kind of birds. Um, but Jesus says, you know, I care for the sparrows and I care for you. To use an older word, here's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about providence. We don't use that word much anymore. Providence, oh, that's a hospital, right? Providence is the protecting, caring provision of the Father for his people in big and little things. That's what Jesus says. I know the hairs on your head. I know the devastating news that you just got the day before yesterday. The big and the small. It just it's, it means that God is He keeps track of the birds. He keeps track of His people in the big and little things. So, providence. His eyes on the sparrow means God is for us. We, we matter to Him. And, and he's, he's watching over us because he wants us to keep on this journey of following Jesus and to live out our purpose and our destiny in life. Romans chapter 8, 31, Apostle Paul speaks of this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, big things, little things, in between things. Paul wrote that to a small church in the city of Rome, the, the citadel of the Roman Empire with all the multiple gods, and they had, they had it rough. They had a lot of, and he says, hey, you, you feel like a little uh, home sparrow there in Rome, but God is for you. Before there was Taylor Swift, there was Ethel Waters. She was the singer everyone wanted to listen to. Ethel Waters, if you're not familiar, she sang jazz, swing, pop music. She was on Broadway stage. She performed in concerts. She was nominated for an Academy Award. She did movies. Um, she was the first African-American to star in her own TV show, Man or Woman. Um, she had amazing pipes. She just had this overpowering alto voice that people love to hear. Um, 
her mom conceived Ethel when her mom was raped at knife point by a family member. Um, it's, it's her, her, Ethel's life is a reminder that God cares about all kids, all kids, all children in the womb, even those that have that sad beginning. Um, there wasn't the great accessibility of abortion back then. So she was birthed. And she was raised in the church, in the black church, and she, she developed a, a faith in Jesus. But as she grew and her talent grew, she walked away. She began to sing. She began to be famous. And for the next 40 years, there was no... This Jesus that had met her as a young person, uh, she walked away from that. And she was famous, well-known and well-loved, but there was a lot of heartache, multiple marriages, dealing with trauma from her family and her beginnings, uh, sexual confusion in her life. And then... By age 60, Ethel, famous with all those awards, um, her health was now declining, and her beauty and her musical talent was fading, and she'd had a series of just like professional meltdowns, like people no longer wanted to hire her, you know, she was she's like this aging star that was toxic to people. Um... She started listening to Billy Graham on the radio. And he came to New York City where she lived, and he did a crusade, it, actually one of the epic crusades. He did Madison Square Gardens for 16 weeks, six nights a week crusade. Two and a half million people came there. One of these two and a half million people was Ethel Waters. And uh, she went several nights, you know, heard the anointed preaching, her heart began to stir and then, um, but because she was famous, people are you know, hey, that's Ethel Waters over there. She's the Billy Graham crusade, you know. And one night, Cliff Barrows, who was Billy's uh, song leader, he approached her and said, hey, uh, Miss Waters, um, I'd love to have you sing with the choir. Could you, could you sing a song with the choir? And Billy would do this. He would invite people onto his crusades who weren't yet Christians, but were on the way to Jesus. Uh, I, I heard him I heard him uh, in Anaheim, this is back in the mid-80s, he invited uh, Johnny Cash and June Cash. And this was just after Johnny had had another one of his, you know, uh, prescription drug meltdown kind of things. And, and he invited him on the platform, and, and June told their story, their testimony with all of its warts, you know. But anyway, so he said, can, can you sing? And she said, well, I could. And he said, could you sing? His eye is on the sparrow. And she had been nominated for an Oscar for that song in a 1952 movie. Um, you can look it up and get that clip on YouTube. It's pretty pretty touching. And here's what Ethel wrote later. She said, So that night I sang His Eyes on the Sparrow. And standing there, there was just me and my guilt and Jesus. Jesus who had never left me. He had never, not once, turned away from me. I was the one who had turned away from him for 40 years. She says, Billy clarified God's forgiveness for me. And as I sang, I received it. And the honesty that the dear Catholic sisters had taught me as a child, that kind of almost dogged honesty that characterized my earlier life, it paid off this time again. I faced up to the fact that I had a decision to make, and I decided for Jesus. And that thereafter, when I listened to Billy, I experienced a peace that I had never known before. Ethel Waters dedicated the remaining 20 years of her life, um, really traveled with Billy Graham often, would sing at his crusades, and, and recorded several Christian albums. But her signature song, the song she sang that night in 1957, where she, got, she met Jesus as she sang it, is, is this words. Many of you know this. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? 
Why should my heart feel lonely? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. That's what Jesus taught in Luke 12. And I know he watches me. There may be somebody listening to me this morning in the room or online that today's your day to do what Ethel Waters did. Maybe it's coming back to Jesus. Maybe it's meeting Christ for the first time. Just getting honest and saying, I need you, and I'm hearing today that you have not lost sight of me. Come to Christ today. Jesus gives his disciples in, in Luke 12 words of warning and comfort, but then he, he also gives them a charge. Uh, Erica gave a charge yesterday to the women, I understand. A strong exhortation. He says, verse 8, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. Kind of interesting, angels of God, I guess the, the heavenly host. I assume the, the Father is in that uh, punch too. Over, over the angels, obviously. Uh, but whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Um, you know, that last verse is a subject of a lot of uh, conversation. Mark's gospel and Luke's and Matthew also include that, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and they each are in a little bit different context. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult statement. It's kind of like, lead us not into temptation. Like, why did you say it that way, Jesus? <laughs> but he did. Uh, but what it seems when you look at the, the different places where it's, it's said, it seems that to blaspheme in the Holy Spirit is to resist and refuse the witness of the Holy Spirit about who Jesus is. So Jesus called himself while he's on the earth the son of man multiple times. So he says, hey, you might reject me during his three years of public ministry, and a lot of people did. Both thieves on the cross rejected him initially, and then the one after some time repented. Lots of priests, lots of Pharisees rejected Jesus um, during his public ministry. But apparently, I, I think that the sense is, hey, you, you can do that, but when the Holy Spirit, after he's died, risen, ascended, when the witness of the Holy Spirit is said, no, that's what's not forgivable. Now, we understand, like, Peter denied Jesus three times. He was forgiven. Paul had a whole season in his life where he was, like, you know, destroying the church and, you could say, blaspheming in, and... He got saved. So it's not like a one-time thing. This is a, a settled decision, a hardened heart that just says, no, I w I'm not responding to that conviction of the Spirit. By the way, that conviction of the Spirit is, comes to everybody. But that person that just says, no, and eventually get hardened, that's what it says, not forgivable. By the way, we even Luke even says, a number of disciples in Jerusalem and Increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Isn't that encouraging? Some of those guys that said, hey, you're on the cross. They, some of those guys even were the gospel. They responded to the witness of the Spirit. So if you're somebody who is wondered or troubled, if you've committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that uh, sensitivity of the heart is evidence that you have not. Jesus seems to be talking about people who just said, and there are people who just said, nope. Don't want it, don't believe it, don't, don't need it. But it is a firm warning to those who think, yeah, I, I'm just going to kind of treat this thing as a philosophy or I, I, one idea to debate it among other ideas, you know. That might be interesting, but Jesus says, you refuse this witness of God's Holy Spirit about who Christ is and of the good news. When you uh, meet him one day, there will be no... There'll be no pardon for that. But Jesus is not 
endorsing a sloppy agape, whereby we just say, hey, I've always got forgiveness in my back pocket, so I'm just going to go with the flow. That's a very dangerous, but I'm going to walk down this road here because it looks interesting. And ah, it might not be the best road, but I can always... He's warning us against these kinds of things. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will always acknowledge before the angels of God, but whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. You know, in uh, late summer, um, late fall, no, Late May and early June of 1989, there was a uh, pro-democracy demonstration happening right in the heart of Beijing in Tiananmen Square. I've been to Tiananmen Square. It's like their, their Times Square. And they were mostly young people, mostly students, and they, were, they even made a, sta a, little, a little Statue of Liberty. They were just saying, hey, we're tired of this communist thing. We want freedom. And 1989 was this amazing year. It's the year that the Berlin Wall fell and lots of crazy things were happening. And the world was, was looking at this thing and thinking, but did it happen in China too, you know? And, uh, and of course, the Chinese got very nervous about this and so they started blocking the press from covering it. Um, and then finally, on June 5th, 1989, they sent in the, they sent in the troops and they said okay we're gonna we're gonna close this thing down enough of this and um, there was a photographer uh, and he was in a hotel and he saw these tanks coming and he thought this would be a good shot and he was you know again the, the media was restricted so he was kind of secretive he's trying to get the picture and he said all of a sudden this guy walked out in front of the tanks and the guy had dark trousers and like, looked like a shopping bag. And at first, the guy with the camera thought, man, he's going to mess up my shot. I had this great shot of the tanks, you know, for he worked for one of the Associated Press. Uh, he didn't realize that he was going to capture one of the iconic images of that decade, maybe the last few decades. Because um, this man came out and stood in front of the, <laughs> the tank. And the tank stopped. And then the tank tried to move around him, and the guy moved over in front of the tank here. Eventually, they called him Tank Man. And then Tank moved this way, and he moved over there. And eventually, he even crawled up on the tank and appeared to be talking to somebody that was in the tank. Um, the standoff went for a while, and then some people, bystanders, they just they came out, and they literally grabbed him and said, dude, you're going to be flattened. And they, they, took, they took him away. Um, to this what day, we don't know who he was. We don't know whatever happened to him. But Tank Man remains a powerful example of somebody who said, I will not bow down. I, I, will, I, will, I will take a stand for what I believe. Um, and I think that's what Jesus is looking for, men and women who say, I will stand up. I will testify. I don't know what's going to happen, but here I stand. But Martin Luther stand. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Last verse. Jesus says, when, you come, when you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, don't worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. But the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. I don't think Tank Man had a plan. I think Tank Man just knew I need somebody needs to step forward and and give a picture to the world as to what's going on in my country. You often hear me say, uh, "Shut up and show up." Shut up, show up and shut up. That's how I say it. I'm getting kind of old, you know. I get I get my words tangled there. Show up and shut up doesn't mean that you don't say anything, but it means when you and I are prompted by God to do something, we're prompted by God to go somewhere, we sometimes think, oh, well, I, don't, I don't know, you know, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to say, and so what? We don't go. And instead, just show up, shut up, like I don't know what I'm going to do or say here, but I'm here, God, because you told me to come. Um, 
And Jesus is saying there, I think, hey, go and let me figure it out, what you're to do or to say. Just follow the prompting that I give you to go. I mentioned my mentor, Bill Frizzell, earlier. Bill used to say, when God gives you a microphone, use it. When you have an opportunity, and he, didn't, he wasn't just talking about front, he said, when you have an opportunity to speak up, and you know, hey, there's an opportunity, he says, do it. <laughs> God gave you that opportunity and follow through with that. So God, give us courage to stand and deliver for the truth of who God is and the truth of the gospel. This table that we're going to come to in a moment here, it's a table about blood being shed. It's a table that reminds us that a life was laid down because the Father told him to lay it down because he wanted to lay it down because the Father, Son, and the Spirit wanted to do it for us. And God did it so that we could do something, that we could have this joy of following him, enjoying obeying him, honoring him, giving an example for other people to believe in him. So this morning, Selena, if you would come, and Austin, um, come to this table this morning with a grateful heart and come to this table to receive a fresh anointing of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, the power and presence of Jesus in your life. That's why we call it communion, because we come, he will meet us there, and good things will happen. The body of our Lord, given for us, his blood poured out for us as a new promise. The table is open.
going to sing one last song together, so if you want to stand up. The wages of my sin was death.
Yes. Risen. Crucified, risen Jesus. An honor to be hearing from you again today. What an honor to sense you moving among us as you are. So send us in power, God. Give us stories this week. Help us to overcome the hypocrisy, overcome the fear, and to come back with a story of how you gave us courage. Make us to be tank men, tank women, those who stand. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Hey, we're going to take a break. This is our, uh, our month. We're going to say goodbye to the live stream for you, but this is our month to pray for our friends serving overseas. If you need to go, feel free to go. But if you can stay and lean in to pray, we'll start that probably in about a minute or so here. So.